and I'm going to record and let's hope this works. So hello, Zoomers. No rumors today, as I've predicted. There's a winter storm warning that means stay home. That's what that means. So I'm happy to oblige. Thanks for being here as usual. Uh, this morning, I put up your project outline document that is due in about three weeks, I think, March 6th. And it's one page, uh, about five questions. Basically, in order to complete it, you need to figure out if you want to work with yourself or a partner. You are allowed to work in pairs if you so choose. And what kind of data you want to play with. The idea is for you to have that figured out at least by March 6th and then to give me a sense as to what you're planning on doing so that I can weigh in on that plan and give you appropriate guidance. So uh, if anyone wants to ask me questions about that at any point, of course, you're welcome to do so. But I just wanted to point that out that that is now available. Um, next thing due is your accuracy draft for homework one. So that is due Monday. Looks like several of you have already turned that in, so good work. Uh, next thing after that will be a formative assessment that doesn't exist yet, and I will let you know when that is available. i got to figure out what I want to ask you. <laughs> this is a, you know, a, a relatively new class, like most of it is new in terms of what I'm putting together in what order, so we'll, we'll just see what, you know, what we feel like talking about. Uh, what we have for today, then, is hopefully the remainder of Lecture 3 and Example 2, Part 2, to segue into the wonderful world of structural equation modeling and multivariate models for longitudinal data more broadly construed. Do you want to review from last time? Would that be helpful to start off with, as opposed to diving back into new stuff? One nod for review, one thumb for review. Three thumbs, okay. Let's do that. Uh, picture time. Let me find, there's the My Beach screen. Here we go. Let's see, we were talking about these sort of pictures right here, multi-level SEM stuff. So this is slide six, we'll go back to that. So we had started with just a random linear time model, unconditional with respect to other predictors, so just time by itself, and the translation of that into an MSEM, as it is called, multi-level structural equation model. So this is a, an estimation framework in which you're working with long data. So one row is an occasion, multiple rows per person, and you can predict multiple columns in your data set at the same time. So to me, that is multivariate and longitudinal at the same time. In this picture, then we have a box representing observed variables in your data set. Circles or ovals represent latent variables, so random effects and residuals in this context, because this is not really a measurement model from the traditional sense. Y is one box here and time is one box here because this is long data. That will matter when we talk about how the same model would be translated into a single level SEM framework in which each occasion would be multiple boxes. One box per occasion, excuse me, each variable would be multiple boxes. So in this case, the idea is that this box right here for level one Y, it has its variance being partitioned by the model. So the model is going to estimate a residual variance at level one, which we would call our within-person variance. Our random intercept variance at level two is this idea of this circle here. And the prediction of y from time, as shown by this directed arrow here, from time is the predictor to y is the outcome, that slope itself is a latent variable that we would call the linear time slope. So the, the main thing that switches in terms of the idea here is that in SEM land, we think about generally the whole latent variable as an entity, like beta zero is now a variable that you can predict or have predicted by other things. Beta one is now a variable. And so the means of those variables, we would call the fixed effects. So beta zero mean is the fixed intercept as shown in the notation here. And the variances of these variables, we would call the random effect variances. So we still have fixed and random as separate parameters and separate ideas, but in the code, they tend to be sort of pushed together more because the code is going to refer to beta zero and beta one specifically as variables in the analysis. 
they're just not in the data set. We make them through the estimation procedure. So we looked at some code then in terms of M plus code to do multi-level structural equation modeling as this is known. So even though this is still just a univariate multi-level longitudinal model here, um, it's considered an MSIM because of the software, but it's not taking advantage of all of the things that you can do. It's just a simple version. So this is like a simple case of what is possible. So the within model is for level one, between model is for level two. And when you see a variable listed by itself, like Y semicolon here, that is referring to its variance. So if Y is listed by itself in the within model, that's referring to its level one residual variance. Y listed by itself here in the second row, for instance, in the between model is referring to its random intercept variance. Likewise for Lin, Lin is the name of the latent variable to be created from the regression of time predicting Y. So think of on as an equal sign in terms of the order here. Y equals X will help you. So Lin is a placeholder for the idea that we need a beta one. Beta one, as the Lin variable then, has all of its parameters in the level two model. So the variance of the linear slope across people is the Lin that's listed by itself here. The covariance between the intercept and the linear slope is this width statement. And then in brackets, those are either means or intercepts. Intercepts are things that are predicted, means are for variables that are not predicted. And so these would be the fixed intercept and the fixed linear slope. Okay, makes sense so far? Cool. Then if we add, say, a quadratic, so we have another circle here and time squared as a second box in the analysis. Then code to estimate a random quadratic model would look like this on slide nine. The difference is that we've added qua as another variable to the analysis whose mean is going to be the fixed quadratic slope and whose variance is going to be the random quadratic slope variance across people. And so the fixed quadratic is in the bracket, random quadratic is here, and then the covariances are in the last line. Adding in a level two predictor is slide 10. And in this picture, the arrows go from the level two X into each of our three level two latent variables. And then we have the paths that describe how level two X predicts the intercept linear slope and quadratic slope as gamma 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, excuse me, 1, 1, and 2, 1, respectively. So the code for this then would be on slide 11, where the new piece is just the last line here in the between model. I have level two X predicting Y as the intercept for Y, linear and quadratic slopes of time predicting Y as well. And so you can have multiple variables on either side of an on. That way you can write like one line of code and describe multiple sets of regressions at the same time. So it's a, an efficient syntax system to be able to do this. So up until this point in the example model shown, there has not been a reason why you would need an MSM. Okay, there's no reason to do it this way. You're not gaining anything. You're losing the ability to use Rimmel and denominator degrees of freedom. Gains... One example of a gain is slide 12 here. And uh, Kaylee, if you're listening in office hours yesterday, you asked me this question, this is the answer. Level two X in this picture is actually now an outcome. So we've turned the arrows around so that they go from the circles to the level two X box, that makes it an outcome. So this would ask, how does the intercept, linear slope and quadratic slope each uniquely predict this observed outcome? And this is a level two outcome, and so I put it up here next to the circles in terms of the diagram convention. Um, I had a note that the notation here is a little bit clunky. That's because once you have multiple outcomes being predicted at the same time, the notation somehow has to recognize what is being predicted by each term. So gamma OO, for instance, in the level two model for Y and, and UOI, like it's assumed that they're related to predicting Y because that was the only choice. At this point, now we're predicting both level two X and Y. And so we would want to add either Y subscripts or superscripts or something that would denote these terms are reflecting the prediction of Y, whereas these terms over here are reflecting the prediction of X as an outcome. 
So we have then an estimated fixed intercept for my level two x-box. We have slopes of beta zero, beta one, and beta two, each predicting x, and then we have some kind of residual for that prediction, which I've labeled a u since it's going to be a level two variance. Code would look like this, where the difference is in the placement of the on. So we've flipped the left and right sides of the on. That changes the level two x from a predictor on the previous slide if it's on the right side. If it's on the left side, now it's an outcome. And the last two add the parameters that would come along for the ride. You don't have to write these, they're estimated by default. But level two x in brackets is going to be its intercept. Level two x outside of brackets is going to be its variance. In this case, it's gonna be its leftover variance after being predicted by our three circles here. So then if you wanted to bring a predictor into the likelihood, so that it can have missing data and not have those cases be kicked out of the model, then this is how you would do it. If you didn't want it to actually be predicted, you would essentially be fitting an empty model for it where you wouldn't have these three slopes, but you would have an intercept and some kind of residual left over. Then from an estimation perspective, that variable is an outcome, even though it's not being predicted because its sample characteristics, its mean variance and covariance have are going to have to be recreated by the model the same way that it is for y in this case. So it's an outcome from an estimation point of view. That means that you can have missing data under an assumption of missing at random because this is full information maximum likelihood, but it also means that you're then invoking distributional assumptions, univariate normal in this case. Uh, I have been unsuccessful in getting M plus to change that, by the way. It doesn't like it when you say an outcome, for instance, is categorical if it's not truly an outcome. Okay, there. We got to that point before, so questions thus far? I have two, Lisa. Hit me. Yeah, first, uh, should we center those predictors, the linear time slope for, and for the quadratic time slope as we do in multi-level analysis? Ah, that's a great question. Um, one could somehow, but that would become fairly tricky because in the slopes, for instance, the mean of that is an estimated parameter. So by saying like that the mean would, like if we were trying to force it to zero, for instance, then we would be saying that there's no change on average. Mm. So I think that you would probably not be able to do so in this context. Like you would just have to say that level two X, the intercept is for somebody who has a time slope of zero, even if that's not necessarily possible. Mm. Uh, so the second question is to estimate the outcome, should we take the factor mean and multiply it by the numbers we are interested in, we are interested in, or how can we estimate those those values for a specific people? Uh, I'm not understanding the question yet. Please keep talking. Yeah. Yes. Um, so then we will have the results for this model. How can we use those results to estimate to estimate a specific outcome for a specific people as as we do in multi-level analysis using, for example, the predict 1D function. Ah, like generate predicted values for the level 2x? Yes. Is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. Yep. Uh, we would do it the same way. Uh, you would use basically the fixed effects and you would fill in um, prototypical values for someone's intercept, linear slope, and quadratic slope. And then uh -huh. you could predict what their level 2x would be. Hmm. Great. Okay. So, Thank you. Yeah. The, where this gets really tricky beyond just the centering is in thinking about what high and low means. So when a slope is a predictor, right, we want to use the same sort of language. Like I have to be very careful in this. Let's say that the time slope is the predictor. The time slope has a slope in predicting something else now. <laughs> the time slope is a predictor variable. This, by the way, this, this gesture means predict, like, call them in your data set. That's what this means if I keep doing that. So if we I think cannot of, see you, Lisa. You cannot see me? Oh, 
No, Hang on. your, it's, your it's, camera it's, is off. It turned my camera off. Oh, okay. Now I, I can see you. Thank you. Okay, hang on. I'm going to experiment here. Is, yeah, is okay. this going to turn my camera off? Is there some like, you know, hand gesture shortcut to these that I'm not privy to? Okay, it's still on. All right, tell me if it happens again because I swear I didn't touch anything. That's super weird. My camera has been off for a while. Why you don't tell me? <laughs> Make me look like a dumbass. Come on, kids. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Goodness gracious, as my mother would say. All right, back on point. What I was trying to say is if you think about like how you first learned how to interpret a slope, right? A positive slope means as x goes up, y goes up. And a negative slope means as x goes up, y goes down, right? Cool. Now, what does x goes up mean in the context of an individual time slope? Well, if you're in a situation where everyone is growing and growing at different rates, then a high value would be somebody who changes like rapidly, right? Like someone who has a steep slope would be high and a low value on X as the slope for time would be someone who changes less rapidly, has a, low, a slower rate of decline. That's all well and good, but what if you're modeling change that is a decrease over time instead? So if all the slopes are going down, what being higher than everyone else would mean is that you change less. Your slope would be closer to zero if you are on the high side of the distribution if everyone is, is declining. And somebody who would be low on that variable is actually someone who's changing more. So in trying to interpret these effects of slopes, let's put it that way, like gamma 1x here, I would have to know, I would have to have a good sense of what the slope distribution would be. So maybe a 95% confidence interval around the fixed slope could help me figure out if everybody's going up or everybody's going down or whether it's a mix of both, and then how to think about like what high and low would be. I could then take, you know, plus or minus one standard deviation on that variable, for instance, which would be given by the square root of the variance that goes with it. And, you know, then I could calculate predicted level two x's at someone who's high and someone who's medium and someone who's low. So that, that's one source of sort of extra layers of what can make this confusing. Another is when we think about these slopes as unique effects. So again, think back to when you first learn regression and you, and you learn the concept of, hey, if multiple predictors are in the model at the same time, their slopes are going to be different than if each was only in there by itself, right? bivariate versus multivariate, multivariable relationships, unique relationships. So from that perspective, how problematic is it to think about the unique contribution of linear time slope after controlling for quadratic time slope and vice versa? Like those are going to be really highly related variables. And it's quite possible that there is a relationship between change in level 2x that would get wiped out if you let both of them predict this variable at the same time. They would each probably have non-significant unique effects because there's so much overlap. So that makes it tricky to have slopes as predictors too. And that's one of the reasons why if it's possible to do so, it can be more advantageous to try and coax nonlinearity into a single latent variable to do the prediction of other things rather than spread it across like linear and quadratic time. I'm going to show you a way to do that using what is known as a latent basis model, and that is an SEM-specific hack that the multi-level side does not have. I cannot hear you.
Define them, you created the predictors for centering them, and you also put them in the use variable.
log likelihood value, and results. Do you want to walk through the results? Yes, please. Yes, please. All right. Well, since you said please. All right. What's this thing? First line here, recall on times squared. The quadratic effect of time? Yep, that's my fixed quadratic time slope. What about this number right here? The residual variance for recall in the within model. Residual variance of level one? Yep. What, that was it. Yeah, what's that one? You can type to me or you can talk, folks, your choice. That's the cross-level interaction, right? Yeah, that is the effect of cohort on the linear time slope. These ones are what? It's the effect of cohort and cohort squared. Yeah, they are level two fixed effects. They are predicting the intercept of recall specifically. I wish that it would just say that, but it doesn't. Okay, how about these two? One of these is obvious and one of them is not. Under intercepts, we have a line for recall and we have a line for learn. To me, the first is the fixed intercept for recall, the yes. outcome. The second one would be the factor mean, the factor mean for the linear predictor. Yeah, the factor mean for the linear uh, slope variable. So this is this is confusing potentially here, right? The intercept of the linear. It's like what? Linears don't have intercepts. Well, they kind of do. If we go back to the equation, if I think of this right here as like a regression model, the first thing that predicts my outcome that's just sitting there by itself, not multiplying anything, is kind of like the intercept of that beta one equation. I'm doing air quotes around intercept. So it is the fixed linear time slope, but from this perspective of beta one being a variable, it is the intercept for beta one. So I'll say that again. From the perspective of beta one being a variable to be predicted, what we would normally call the fixed linear time slope is the intercept of beta one. <laughs> the face is no, no, it's not, Lisa. I I'm trying, I'm trying to help you. It's not intuitive. But yeah, the, these are, these are the, the factor means, so to speak. They're labeled as intercepts because they're each being predicted by cohort. The first one is what I would call the fixed intercept. The second one is what I would call the fixed linear time slope. And then last but not least, under residual variances, what is this number 10? And don't tell me it's level one residual because that's not what it is. What's left? It's in the between model. There's your hint. Yeah, that's my random intercept variance. And then this line right here looks sort of curious. It has an estimate of zero and a standard error of zero, and then a test statistic and a p-value of 999. Those are not numbers, folks. Yes, we fixed this. This would have been the random linear time slope variance, but we fixed it to zero. So because we fixed it, they can't compute a test statistic for it. 
So 999 is like missing data. It means like we can't, we can't make this for you. It's not a real number. I think we have one more. Yep. What if we wanted to add a random linear time slip? Okay, what's different in the code? Anything different in the first part here? If I wanted to add a random linear time slip to my model, anything new here? Nope. I already have all the pieces, all the variables defined in the model, in the right spot in the model. There are two things different in the code. Let's see if you can find them both. This code now has a random linear time slope in it, which changes two of the lines, two spots. Right here is one. It used to be at zero. The other, that one. This is our covariance. Anytime that you have multiple random effects for the same person, they get to be related. So that's the off diagonal of the G matrix right here. It is not estimated by default, by the way. Not in this setup. So that means that in the output, we now have this term right here, the between model residual variance for lin. I would call that my random slope variance for, lin for linear time. And we have recall with lin. That's the covariance between the random intercept and the random linear time slope. Those are my two new parameters. Everything else is the same. And I think that's the last one. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I tried to do the interrobang model. By the way, I got it to estimate. <laughs> So the, the catch to trying to put a random slope, random slope at level two looks exactly like it does at level one. You name it, and then you define it as to what the regression is that you're trying to make random. And so I called it intero for intero bang, and tried to put that new parameter into the model, and it gave me a lot of error messages. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. I tried but it didn't work. Okay. Questions or comments on that? Lisa? Yes. To compare across those models, they are nested, so uh, we could use the likelihood ratio test, right? Yes. But but in M plus, we should save those estimates in an object and then use it uh, in the other syntax as as we did last semester. Uh, no, that was only for diff test. That was for um, when you're doing using weighted least squares estimation. You have to do it uh -huh. that way. Um, yeah, to the best okay. of my knowledge, there is no way to make M plus do a likelihood ratio test for you. There's no, there's no option for that as far as I know. But this is where if you work within the um, M plus automation package within R, you can run M plus from inside R and then port back the output into R objects. And then you could use like ANOVA or whatever you do in R to do likelihood ratio tests without having to get your calculator out. Great. Thank you. Sure. Are you ready to see the regular flavor SEM side? Okay, here we go. Back in the lecture three, slide 13. And I have messed a bit with some of these slides relative to the first version of this, but, um, so, but the current version of this PDF is available for download after I also fixed my typos. So here's the translation. Uh, if you've had SEM before, this will probably make more sense. If you haven't had it, then don't worry if, if some of this doesn't make sense. I, it's basically we're tricking SEM into being able to do longitudinal modeling. So in SEM, for instance, what it's typically used for is fitting latent variable measurement models. It's the idea that if you have multiple variables that are all supposed to be measuring the same thing, 
you can make a more reliable version of that construct by taking into account what those variables have in common. And essentially a latent variable is like taking all of the covariance among these things that are supposed to measure the same thing and putting a circle around it and giving it a name. So a latent factor is imaginary, but it's a construct that you believe to exist. We just can't measure it directly. We measure it indirectly through variables that we can see. So in terms of the notation, the first line here, it describes what would be called a measurement model. This would be confirmatory factor analysis in particular. We're pretending that these outcomes are continuous, normally distributed variables. And I have YTI, because we're talking about time in this class. So the first term here is an intercept. This is per occasion. So I've shown what this compact equation would look like if you wrote it out for each, each occasion, one through four in this picture. So I have an intercept at time one, at time two, at time three, and at time four. So that would be like if we were fitting a regression model for each of these y's, the intercept would be its beta zero. But in this notation system, we use mu instead. Then we have this orange thing. That is called a factor loading. It is lambda. And it is a slope. Why we need a special symbol for a slope, I don't know, but the entire world of factor analysis writes it this way, so I'm not going to try and go against that grain. What the slope is multiplying is f. f stands for factor. My notation scheme is designed not just about what people conventionally use, but also letters I can reliably write on, the, on a chalkboard. That's why it's f. <laughs> The, uh, the textbooks that I use for SEM and the one and the chapters that I give you for this unit use a Greek letter that I call squiggle two. I'm not actually sure what it's, what it's really called, but I know there's squiggle one because it has like one curly Q on the top versus two curly Qs. It's squiggle two. I don't think I could draw that if my life depended on it. So I don't use it in my notation. So F stands for factor. Uh, last but not least, we have E, which is our time specific residual. And so we'd have one of those. So these four equations to describe how y is predicted from this single factor are also described by this diagram here. This is a very conventional factor analysis or, or structural equation modeling diagram, where again, imaginary things are in circles and real things are in boxes. So each outcome in this case is partly due to the factor and how much of it is due to the factor is captured by its factor loading, which is this slope right here and it's partially due to not the factor. So these E's are called unique variances or specific variances or error variances or residual variances. I don't care what you call them, they're just not the factor. Whatever is not in common, that's what this represents. It's variance left over. And I have the U's, the, the mu's here sort of stuck in the boxes because I didn't want to use the stupid triangle thing that clutters up the diagram. So each of these would have an estimated intercept for the expected outcome when someone's at a factor score of zero. So the measurement model parameters are these outcome-specific intercepts, factor loading slopes, and the variance of the residuals. And then what's known as the structural model would be parameters related to the factor, its mean, its variance, and any covariances across factors. So that's from a measurement modeling perspective. That would look very familiar if you've had SEM, but at least it sort of looks like regression if you haven't. The only catch is that F is imaginary. Okay. With me so far. All right, so here's how we get from here to there. Yeah, and note the colors, all right? The loadings here, they're in that same orange color that my time variable was. Not a coincidence. So here's how we get from a random linear time model, which looks like this in MLM, into this SEM world. So an SEM diagram, Note that I have five boxes here because this would be a model with five occasions. In the previous slide, I only had four boxes because this slide only was about four occasions. So that's the big difference in terms of how you think about your data structure and what the model would look like. This is wide data. It is one box per occasion. So you need to know how many occasions you have to know how many boxes to draw. Whereas in the multi-level SEM diagram, Y was just one box regardless of how many occasions that you had. So this is five occasions of data in this example. And to fit a random linear model, I need two different latent variables, beta zero and beta one. 
the rounded box here, by the way, this is me trying to make the diagram less cluttered. It's the idea that each of these residuals is constrained to have the same variance over time, and that's why I've sort of shoved them together into this rounded circle rather than having five circles. Some people don't like that, but it makes me happy. So the first switch to get from a traditional confirmatory factor model to what we need for a longitudinal analysis is that we need two factors. So we got to rewrite our model to include two different factors, and I'm just going to call them F1 and F2. So notably, we still only have one intercept for each of these outcomes and one residual variance, but we've picked up a separate factor loading for each latent factor. So this is what it would look like if your observed outcome was thought to reflect two different constructs at the same time. Next step, we're going to shut off the intercepts. The intercepts here, these green mu terms, tell us basically what the mean of the variable is going to be. Most of the time in factor analysis, we set the means of the factors to zero so that we can estimate these intercepts instead. We're going to flip it. So we're going to force all of these intercepts that are for specific occasions to zero so that we can push up to the factor level all of the information that we have about their means. So we're going to shut it off. Please have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so I was <clears throat> looking ahead a little bit. and I was looking at the factor of curves model. And so when you have that like Illuminati triangle at the very top, yeah. is that controlling the intercepts for a certain value like uh, this? Yeah. So to, to draw that, the, the Illuminati triangle, yeah, the stupid triangle is what I normally call it, but I like Illuminati too. That is a diagram convention to introduce means and intercepts as basically multiplying a vector of ones. In this case, we would not, we would have an Illuminati triangle, but it would only be going to the latent variables because the observed variable boxes, oh, okay. are, their intercepts are going to be shut off. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So think back to the, your choices for model identification in SEM for those of you who are like, this is weird. If you wanted to estimate your factor mean, then you would have to use a marker item intercept and shut that intercept off at zero, right? Something's got to be zero and something's got to be one in terms of, of, of identification. So when we're talking about the factor mean, that has to be zero, or you can force one of the intercepts to be zero. We're going to do better than that. We're going to force all the intercepts to be zero so that all of the information about the level of these outcomes over time is going to be captured by the factors instead. That's their job. So that's the first thing. After adding two factors instead of one, we're going to shut off the intercepts. Then we're going to combine the fixed and random effects into this idea of, of F. So basically, the model is phrased to talk about beta 1 and beta 0 in the notation. We don't split out the part of F1 and F2 that is due to its mean versus deviations from the mean, the way that we do fixed and random. So after we shut off the intercepts, and let's rename F1 into beta 0 and rename F2 into beta 1, then this is starting to look exactly like our level 1 model here. I added the first factor loading has to be 1 because there's nothing multiplying beta 0, and so that's like the same idea. And what is multiplying beta 1 is time up here. So that's going to be that's going to have to be covered by my second factor loading. So if I rearrange the equation, this is exactly the same thing. It's just that the time variable has to do the, the loadings have to do the job of the time variable. And so that's why time is orange here. It corresponds to the factor loadings here. The factor loadings tell us how much time has passed relative to a reference occasion that we set as the time zero. So given that these are one, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, those are the loadings that I put on here. So the model is phrased to think about beta 0 and beta 1 as latent variables. Their, fixed, their means are the fixed effects, their variances are the random effect variances. The information about how much time has passed 
between my boxes that would normally be carried by the time predictor variable in my data set, we have to enforce that information through the pattern of factor loadings. So the fact that I have basically taken linear time and stuck the values on here that reflect that means that the interpretation of data one is a linear time slope. Lisa, um, if is there a way in M plus? Because like if we want to model um, like different covariance structures for the um, you know, uh, between occasions, is there a way to do that easily or yeah. not? <laughs> uh, there's a way to do it. Um, it depends on what pattern, how easy it is. But like if you wanted to say, have an autoregressive pattern in your R matrix, right? Where it, like occasions that are one unit apart are R and two units apart are R squared, like something like that, then that would be with statements, like Y zero with Y one, um. Y one with Y two, and then you would have to put constraints on them that would match whatever pattern of covariance you're trying to put forth, or you could just let them be whatever, and then that would be like an un, like an unstructured kind of idea with respect to the covariances. Okay, so the like graphically, the covariance structure would just be arrows between the indicators. Yep, the same as what we okay. would call a residual covariance in factor analysis. Okay, Hopefully that makes sense. sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that so because we have access to basically all of the person's data on the same row, we can put whatever relationships we want among these boxes. We can make them slopes. We can make them covariances. We can do whatever. In the multi-level SEM and long data, we don't have access to the other rows. So you can't put in like a residual covariance because it doesn't like you have to do it across rows of data, not columns of data. So this type of structure with the wide data is easier if you know that you want to have those kinds of residual relationships phrased as covariances. It's also easier if you know that you want to have lagged relationships. So if you want to have like x at time 1 predict y at time 2, that is going to be easiest to set up usually if they're all on the same row of data and then you can have whatever lags you want at the same time. Uh, the, di the dynamic SEM that uh, M plus has introduced in recent years is incorporating that same capability into long data. That's one of the new features that it has is to be able to do lagged relationships in long data. Okay, how are we doing? Can you lie to me and say we're doing well? Yay! I don't know if we're doing well enough for that. Okay, so for those of you who are like matrix people, here you go. <laughs> I know. I added more to this slide, so this probably looks different than what I initially posted. But I wanted to show you the match between the notation systems that we use to describe how we get to a marginal V matrix, how that changes into a marginal sigma matrix. So we have Z that tells us what occasion somebody has and how much data they have. That's my loading matrix. We have G, which is my level two matrix of random effect variances and covariances. That's the same thing as phi or phi, however you wanna say it in SEM. That's your factor variances and covariances. And then we have R for the level one part that's left over and that is the psi matrix for the residual variances here. So it is literally the same thing with just different letters and I have the exact correspondence down here. So what we would call V as the put back together again, predicted variances and covariances, that's sigma now. Same difference. Um, I also included the mean vector uh, because I realized I didn't even have that in my SEM slides. So I need to go back and add that in here, but this is how you would compute the mean at any occasion um, using matrices as well. It's just the individual variables intercepts plus the loading matrix and then the fixed. Uh, this would be the means of the factors in my notation system. I have a note at the bottom here that sometimes you will see longitudinal models in which people do estimate the intercepts and they don't use a slope. So if I go back to the previous slide, if I don't have beta one in the model and all I have is an intercept, if I do it this way with the loadings all fixed to one, then what I'm saying is that everybody has the exact same uh, that the mean is constant over time. 
If I want each occasion to have a different mean but still have a random intercept, I would have to do that by putting the intercepts back into the model per occasion. So that would translate into a saturated means random intercept model if I did it that way. If I let each occasion have a different mean and I didn't use a time slope to try and model those mean differences. Um, that still assumes parallel change though. So it only controls for mean differences, it doesn't control for individual differences in change. Okay, um, yeah, here's some code. So this is what our random linear time slope model would look like in SEM code. There are shortcuts to making this model, by the way, both in M plus and in Levon, and I'm deliberately not using them so that you can see the full, like what are you asking it to do without having to look at what the defaults are. So this is a new word for us in this class, by is how we tell it about factor loadings. So I have a factor called int and a factor called lin, and they are each measured by y0 through y4, but I am fixing the factor loadings so that I can define what each factor is supposed to represent. If I fix all of the loadings equal to one, that is an intercept. The reason that I have to fix all of the loadings equal to one is because I'm going to estimate the variance of that factor instead. So in terms of identification, we could either fix the variance to one and estimate a constrained loading, or we can fix the loading to one and estimate the variance. Uh, SEM folks, quick quiz for you. What is another name by which you un that I would call a factor where all the loadings are constrained equal? Oh, rash modeling. Yeah, that's a ro that's a rash model or tau equivalent. Mm -hmm. So it's back again. I think there's a C in it. <laughs> no U, but there is a C. Yeah, yeah. The idea that that all of the um, all of the items are equally good constant loadings, like this is what if you this is all that you had in the model. You're saying that all of the occasions have the same mean. It's the same concept just applied in, in this different context. But now I can name, I can use these as variables. So int and lin are now variables in my model. They are gonna be given means inside the brackets. They're gonna be given variances by listing them by themselves. And they're gonna have a covariance, which is a default in here, unlike in the multi-level SEM side. The other piece of it is that I have to force all of the per occasion intercepts to zero so that all of their mean information is up in the factors where I want it. And last but not least, I am putting a constraint by using a label before the semicolon that is going to say everything in this line is going to have the same parameter. What I'm estimating are residual variances for these outcomes, and by using the single word resver, I am saying make all five of them the same. That gives us a complete um, isomorphism, as they call it, directly maps onto what we would do in Elmer. This is a constraint that you can choose not to use. So this is a, a difference in the SEM traditions for growth modeling. Most of the time when you see those models, these residual variances will be allowed to differ across time. That's what they do. I don't recommend that because allowing different residual variances over time is potentially going to steal information away from the random slope. The random slope is introducing heterogeneity of variance. You're double introducing heterogeneity of variance by letting the residual variances differ too. So in I, I, that's not a good strategy unless it really is warranted by the data. So I would tend to start with this constraint and then maybe relax you know, one or two of them if I needed to, but I tend not to do the, the version where they're all different from each other. Uh, here's what it would look like to do random quadratic. This is slide 17. So we picked up a beta 2 in the story multiplied by time squared. It has a fixed effect and a random effect, so that shows up as a third circle here. And note the loadings for it. How did I get those loadings, do you think? 0, 1, 4, 9, and 16. This is a softball question. Where did those numbers come from? You squared them. Yay, I did. And that's how I know that that is supposed to be a quadratic change function, because I made it that way. So you are defining the loadings to mean what you want the variable to mean. That's the key here. 
So what if I wanted to do a piecewise model? Could I do that? Sure I could. I didn't make a slide for it, but I could. I would use whatever system of coding that created the pieces where I would have like, you know, change that shuts off at some point, And then it, the other factor would pick up the change. The loading pattern would exactly match the slope variables that I would use to create the pieces. So you control the loadings, you control what these latent variables mean. This is what it would look like if we had a level two predictor on slide 18. Very much the same. I have, uh, I don't have code in here for that because it won't fit neatly on the slide, but I have it uh, SE inversion in that example. Uh, here's what it would look like if I wanted to use my three latent variables as predictors instead of level two X. Very much the same as what it would look like in the level two model for multi-level SEM once we get this part figured out. Also a weird system of notation would have to change as a function of that. Uh, here is, I lied, I did put code in here. So this is the diff, this is M plus code for a, a SEM model, single level SEM, where level two X is a predictor versus an outcome. So most of this is the same except for the very last section here. So on the left hand side, if level two X is a predictor of my three random effects, it would be those random effects on level two X. If I switched it around, then I switch the order of the terms on the on, level two X is in the left side, predictors are on the right side. And then I also have the intercept and the leftover variance for level two X as well. So I, I, I lied, I did put this in here. Uh, here's the same thing in Levon if you wanna do this in R. And then we get into new stuff. So one potential concern in using the loadings to define how much change has happened relative to a baseline occasion is what if people don't cooperate? Unbalanced time. What if somebody comes in at time like one and a half? Where do I put that? So that's why in SEM we need a way for unbalanced time to be able to say, I actually want individual specific factor loadings not a common set, but individual specific in the same way that we would have an individual specific Z matrix in multi-level that tells which occasion is actually happening for a given row of data. So T scores is how we do that in M plus. I do not know of a way to do that in any other SEM package other than open MX. I think they had definition variables in that one, but that one's a little bit harder to use. So that's definitely one con. A pro would be something called a latent basis model, but it looks like we're going to get to that one next time. I can read the room. It's 1.42, and I can read the clock, too, more importantly than the room. <laughs> we have a standing joke in my house um, whenever there's a football game on and someone asks me, who are you rooting for? You know, my answer is the clock. I'm rooting for the clock. I want the game to be over. <laughs> so I suspect at some points in your classes, you are also rooting for the clock as well. I understand. All right, 143 then says the clock. Any questions or comments about this before we call it a week? Can you repeat shortly the usefulness of T-scores in the case of unbalanced time, please? Yep. What T-scores does is allows you to designate a set of columns in your data that are going to replace the constants here with variables. So you would say, rather than like fixing this to zero, you would say, fix this to column one, fix this to column two, fix this to column three. And then you can have the exact amount of time that has passed that would be contained like normally in, a, in an exact time variable. It's wide data, but it's the same concept. So then if, like, if this person comes in at time one and a half instead of one, their factor loading would be one and a half, not one.
Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay, then thanks for being here. I hope to see folks next week. Let me know if you need anything. Have good weekends. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy snow.